Good morning. Welcome to the American Enterprise Institute, AEI. My name is Mackenzie Eaglin. I'm a senior fellow here working on military issues and budget examination. Are we buying the strategy we say we want, or are we not? Where are the gaps and holes? And it's my pleasure this morning to host the 22nd Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force, a friend and colleague, General C.Q. Brown. He and I have been working together in this job, but we met when he was Commander of Pacific Air Forces, and we'll talk, of course, a lot about Indo-PACOM this morning. I want to offer all of you um, the opportunity, including our online viewers at AEI.org, at C-SPAN, and at Twitter, and at YouTube. <laughs> Did I cover them all? Um, all our various outlets, you were able to send questions via email uh, to, to Taya here at AEI, and via some hashtag, which I'll call out once we have that. Um, I know he needs no introduction, again, General Brown, but I'll just quickly go over. Of course, he's a, he's a command pilot, although he says that's not, that's not the end-all, be-all of why he joined the Air Force. Um, he was commissioned in 1984 from Texas Tech, and he's flown a variety of aircraft, fixed and rotary wing. He's commanded at many different levels. Uh, but what I think is, is my favorite part about his bio is that both he and his wife grew up as military kids. Uh, Mrs. Brown says that's how she learned to embrace adventure. And you, General Brown, you lean towards the Air Force even though you had an Army dad because of its opportunities in engineering. And of course, you have two grown sons who we talk about regularly and whom I know shape and inform your views as chief on this position, on the needs of military families and more. Thank you for coming to AEI. Yeah, my, my pleasure. It's great to be here. Good, good, good to, to see you again as well. Okay, so thank you. So it's on the screen, hashtag Air Force at AEI. We're spelling out Air Force this morning. And then the email, you'll see Taya's email on the screen for anybody who wants to send in your questions, which I'll be able to read up here. And we also have a lot that came through ahead of time. You're a very popular guy. So I thought we could start this morning, sir, by talking about airmen, which right. I figure is probably your most important priority, airmen and their families. There's been a lot of um, data that's come out recently, not just... Um, financial data, which I will dig into on inflation, but um, some surveys from MOAA and others that troops are worried about finances. And we see guidance coming out now from senior leaders at the Defense Department about the impacts of inflation and mitigating those impacts. And so this must be front and center, um, I assume. For, for me, I know I, I'm looking at a, a budget request that assumed inflation for next year, which starts in a few weeks, fiscal year. Uh, of 4%, and we know that there's a new Department of Labor report out that puts defense uh, purchases specifically closer to 15. So that's a big delta. Uh, it's a lot of money, and of course, military pays a big chunk of that delta. So are you hearing about inflation's impacts on troops and families, and are you thinking about this? Are you worried about it? Um, and what did you hear? Because you spent some time, I know, in Indo-PACOM talking to airmen. Sure. Well, you know, as you said, you know, what's really important to me is our my airmen. And when you look at the action orders that I have, uh, the first one is A for airmen. And it's really how we take care of airmen and their, and their families. And I'll highlight just a, a two key areas. Um, before I get to the inflation part, which uh, was a conversation when I went to out to the Indo-Pacific, I um, had uh, six all calls at various bases across the Indo-Pacific uh, at the beginning of the month. Um, and it, it was a topic, but I will highlight that uh, you know it's also something that my wife Shereen's also focused on, and she has a, a a program that is developed by spouses for spouses and families uh, called Five and Thrive, and it's the five areas that our, our families have highlighted that they're really focused on: childcare, education, housing, healthcare, and spouse employment. And so um, those are key areas that uh, really impact not only our families, but also impacts us from a retention standpoint as well. And I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about that too. You know, as we, as we do our budget cycles, you know, we, we project the best we can. We can't predict the future. Yes. Uh, we, we go through a process. We're already working FY uh, fiscal year 24. And so we, we get some planning guidance. And, and as we did, did the planning guidance um, and, and made up reality, that's where we work with the internal to the department, but also with the Congress mm -hmm. on how do we come back and approach where inflation is today. Part of the discussion that uh, I've had with Airmen is um, how responsive we can be. And I think some of our processes are probably not as responsive as they could be to be able to, to address um, aspects of inflation. Uh, sure. One of the key areas that we, uh, we've hit on over the course of the past, not just this past year, but for the past couple of years is housing. Yep. And uh, because of COVID, 
and, and other areas and in inflation in general, um, the housing market is actually, uh, uh, and rent in particular, has uh, you know, boomed in, in certain areas. And so we did do some temporary uh, 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 things to actually help our airmen in certain locations, mm -hmm. about 52 different locations across the department. Mm -hmm. um, but it's something I, I, knew, I do know that we got to look at uh, how are we get more responsive when we see a market start to shift in certain allowances, how do we, as a Department of the Air Force and Department of Defense, be able to shift and be a little bit more responsive? Mm -hmm. At the same time, what I told our airmen as well, what you don't want to do is have something that's a roller coaster right. that is so responsive that uh, they can't build a budget that they can live with. And so it's right. got to have some kind of bounds in it. Okay. And uh, uh, I mean, for me personally, it's a thought process. And we've had some discussions internal to uh, uh, parts of the Air Force of how do, we, how do we start to address this to be a little bit more responsive in certain areas. Uh, to better help support our airmen and families. Um, and uh, the same thing when we uh, look at the, the overseas locations where we have a cost of living allowance. Mm -hmm. When you make these adjustments, to make them uh, a little bit more of a smooth adjustment, mm -hmm. but also be a bit more proactive in, in how we forecast and, and help our airmen and families. So let me just quickly ask about the pay raise. Um, and I, I understand the president's budget request, and that's your official position. And Congress, of course, is seeking to add additional funds, not just for inflation, but for some of the things you're you're talking about. I'm, I applaud Congress's eagerness to help mitigate the impacts of inflation. I'm, I'm worried about two things. One, it's still not enough because inflation is even higher than Congress anticipated in their own marks of the defense bills. And then um, and, uh, secondly, compounding you know, challenges of inflation. That's not just one year. That it imp impacts family budgets year over year. So um, the military pay raise in 21 was 3%. This current year, 2.7, and then expected 4.6. So using my, my previous sort of number crunching, I, I'm worried that's a real pay cut of over 12%, uh, loss of purchasing power on troop paychecks. Are you thinking this might be an area you want to talk to Congress about? Well, I mean, it, as, we, as we engage with Congress, we'll engage on a number of different areas and, and to, uh, look at inflation. But I also think about that there is a monetary aspect of that uh, you know, what goes in each one of our airmen's uh, checkbooks and their, their, local, their, their personal budget, but it's also the other things we do mm -hmm. um, that are non-fiscal uh, yeah. to ensure we're taking care of airmen and families. And there's policies and processes associated with it, and it goes back to the, some of the aspects of the Five and Thrive I, I, mm -hmm. I touched on earlier of areas that are very helpful to families um, that don't necessarily end up being a, you know, a pay raise. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a balance of the areas that we have to continue to work on. I, you know, I'm happy to engage with Congress. I'm also engaging internal to the building. Yeah. Uh, as you might imagine, I get, you know, I get feedback from airmen. I also get feedback from my wife <laughs> uh, because she spends a lot of time talking to airmen and spouses um, to, uh, on these areas that we got to continue to work on. Are you, before we go back, come back to the, just your conversations with airmen and recruiting and getting your message out to the wider American people. I just want to quickly ask, have, has it risen to the level of chief, the impact of inflation on the industrial base, on the aerospace in particular? You know, are program managers coming to you through teams saying we need to look at or renegotiate or reopen or re-up or anything like that? It hasn't gotten to that point where we're actually, uh, um, but I've, I've, as I've engaged with some of our industry partners, they've dropped hints. <laughs> you know, uh, they're having a hard time in some cases hiring, um, yeah. retaining their workforce. Yes. Um, which to me is a signal that uh, it's, it may take longer and it's going to cost more. Uh, and so we've got to be prepared and have those kind of conversations. And, you know, I, uh, no matter what happens, um, I do believe we have to make tough choices. Mm -hmm. And how, you know, how we prioritize um, will be important to make those tough choices of where we put our efforts in to make sure we're, we're providing the capabilities that our airmen and our joint teammates need uh, with our allies and partners been a theme of yours. We'll come it, it, right back to that. But so this labor shortage, interestingly, that, that in the industrial bases experience, and I, I too hear about it on site visits to ship, shipbuilding and aerospace manufacturing production lines, um, it does not seem to be a COVID-specific thing. It seems to be a long-term shift in American workers' uh, desires and, and so much more. Um, and it's obviously impacting the military, the armed forces as well. So recruiting... Um, I, I believe your, your head of recruiting called it a week-to-week -week dogfight, said we, will, we may meet the bare minimum for the Air Force for the fiscal year again, which starts in six or seven weeks. Um, tell me what you're thinking about the recruiting challenges and kind of is it a long-term problem and how are you going to better communicate to the youth that you need to sign up and their families and influencers? All right. 
It is, uh, you know, what we're looking at for, for this particular fiscal year, um, the way uh, our chief recruiting, uh, Major Ed Thomas has described, we're gonna end up landing on fumes. And what he means by that is, you know, we typically have the delayed entry, uh, uh, young people who are signed up for delayed entry, mm -hmm. we typically have a, a pool of folks that are waiting. Right. We're gonna expend a, a good number of those uh, in this year, and then it'll uh, you know, drive some challenges as we go into uh, FY23. Um, as you kind of already described, um, the aspect of the workforce and just the, I guess the dynamic of the workforce today uh, coming out of COVID mm -hmm. is, you know, I just saw something about quiet quitting, um, yes. which I thought was an interesting dynamic. Seen that. Yeah. Um, but it's just the workforce uh, it is a bit different today than when I came in. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, as you said, we have two adult sons and so uh, I learned a lot from them. Um, um, their approach and the way they think about things. And, and that, from our perspective, we gotta look at how we recruit differently. And how do we engage? And as the Air Force um, has gotten smaller, at the number of bases we have around the country have gotten smaller, mm -hmm. the number of, of uh, those who have a relative who has served yep. has gotten smaller, the number of members in Congress that have served has gotten smaller. Mm -hmm. Our touch points with communities um, have, have, uh, have gotten smaller as well. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we're gonna have to do is say, how do we better connect with young people? And not only the young people, but also their influencers, mm -hmm. whether it's their, uh, you know, their parents, aunt, uncle, um, their high school counselor, the high school coaches, um, uh, those they, they turn to that show that, and, and really talk about the opportunities that the, the uh, military provides. And I'll just tell you from my own personal experience, um, as you said, my dad's retired army. Um, this whole thing is his idea. Uh, four years and get out was my original plan. I was gonna be an engineer. Huh. I got a ride in a uh, training aircraft, decided I wanted to become a pilot. I probably flown 17 different aircraft throughout huh. my Air Force career. Matter of fact, that flew on Saturday. Um, <laughs> Which uh, one? Uh, C-37, or Gulfstream, okay. uh, coming back from uh, uh, speaking engagement. <laughs> so I still get to fly. Yeah. And so I, I, I've been there all seven continents um, as part of my uh, Air Force career and growing up as a uh, military uh, uh, kid. And so I've had a lot of opportunities. And I think about when I read my own bio, I pinch myself that of all the opportunities I've had mm -hmm. because of the military. And I think what I want to be able to do is share that with others is there's opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, there's opportunities to serve in uniform. There's opportunities to serve as a uh, Department of the Air Force civilian yeah. um, for those that uh, for whatever reason don't want to uh, wear the uniform. Mm -hmm. But there's great opportunities to serve. Mm -hmm. And what I've found is I've engaged not only uh, internal to the U.S., but uh, I've engaged with some of our allies and partners. And they said, young people want to serve, but they want to serve in a different way. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we got to be mindful of that as well. They, they may not want to serve for a 20 year career, right. you know, um, and we had to understand that and, and what is it, how do we incentivize um, and provide those opportunities and be able to talk about, you know, the opportunities that the Air Force, and particularly the Air Force, but the other services also provide uh, for, for young people. Um, those are the kinds of things that we, we, we have to figure out how best to connect them a bit differently than we have in the past. Mm -hmm. I remember the last base closure round, I was working on Capitol Hill for a member from New England, and the Navy was pulling out of, basically pulling out of New England, and it was a concern at the time, which is now manifest, your, your point that the consolidation of bases where we now have these super mega bases or whatever, it's become a more regionalized military right. as well, where it's not about class and race, it's about more about where you live is also where you come, you know, who you're, you're increasingly shrinking pool. Um, last point on recruiting. General McConville had mentioned, and he, he you know, he was, giving us the grim overview of recruiting for the, the Army as the biggest service. Of course, they're struggling the most. But he said this interesting factoid jumped out of the data uh, for him, which was because, you know, he talked about declining propensity, declining influencers, all of the things you mentioned. But he said um, the one bright spot for Army recruiting was um, future recruits that had come from a school with junior ROTC, a high school. And, and he meant whether or not they served in junior ROTC. Just having it in the school wow. was bringing in more, um, was, was basically saving the Army. Did, do you know if that's true for the Air Force? It does have an impact. Um, I, I, I've always believed young people only aspire to be what they see. Mm -hmm. If you've never seen it, you never say, I want to grow up to be something you've never seen. Mm -hmm. And so by having junior ROTC in, uh, in high schools, it provides opportunities so they actually see um, that aspect. You know, I had junior ROTC in my high school. I was not part of junior ROTC, um, but I, I did have it in my high school. Uh, matter of fact, this past weekend, one of the things we were also doing was you have uh, for that junior ROTC is a uh, flight academy mm -hmm. where we uh, take young people um, 
through junior ROTC. They get uh, about an eight-week program, and they get a private pilot's license at the end of the program. And so I met an uh, Army guardsman whose uh, son had just finished the flight academy. And all he can talk about now is going to the Air Force Academy wow. that he wants to fly. Sounds like a great program. Um, and so we are seeing by certain programs like um, junior ROTC or these flight academies um, greater propensity for, for young people to come towards the military and we will, uh, since we started this program several years ago, we're about a year away from understanding those that got the private pilot's license will actually get a pilot slot hmm. to do that correlation. Um, wow. But it's, it's a great, I think it's a great start. Yes. And uh, we've got to put some focus on that area as well and, and, and provide an opportunity and sh opening up the aperture for young people to see. You may not get a, you know, you may not get a chance to fly, but there's, there's great opportunities inside of the United States Air Force in particular. Two, two, student, two high schoolers with JROTC at their school. I was in it and not in the military, and you weren't, and now you're the chief. Isn't that fun? Okay, let's talk about Accelerate, Change, or Lose, uh, your vision as chief that you, you wrote. Coming, you already talked about A, but um, you know, I kind of want to dovetail it with your recent trip to, you, you ticked off so many, was it nine or 11 countries, um, places uh, in Asia? So tell us, you said... It was focused on airmen. You certainly met with your counterparts as well. But I also want to look at it through the context of how would you grade yourself? You're over two years in the job. And I know, of course, coming from the region like we talked about, um, I'm, I'm just trying to think out loud here with you. Uh, what's the report card from the ground and what's your own report card of, of yourself? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have probably call it give it a solid C <laughs> in some areas. I'm a, I'm a C student. Uh, from my, you look at my GPA from college. Uh, but does, it's not due to lack of trying. Um, I, I do sense that uh, as I'm engaged with airmen, they feel the energy and the need to change. And uh, as I talk to them about agile combat employment, multi-capable airmen, um, that aspect, there's a lot of energy there. And they, I'm willing, and we, as we changed our doctrine to look at mission command, that also has really resonated that you know the ability to provide intent and allow them to go out and execute. Uh, so it's been some, some very positive things. I also know that as I came in this position that uh, in, the, in the mentoring I got was you're going to pick something that's going to take you, you know, four years to do in a four-year job like this. And there's a cultural shift. And a culture sh shift and sometimes takes, takes time. So you're not going to be able to flip a switch and make everything uh, move forward. Uh, I, what I have been really uh, pleased with is the, uh, the partnership I've been able to build with Secretary Kendall. Uh, I'd never worked with him before. I knew of him. But he and I have a very similar mindset of being able to drive change. Mm -hmm. And I could not ask for a, a better partner in, in areas and the expertise that he has yeah. to help you know, myself and the rest of the Air Force drive change. Um, and so that, that, uh, it's very positive in, in a, lot of, a lot of areas. Um, I, I also believe that you know, as I engage with other women, um, they see some of the same frustrations I do you know, with bureaucracy, which is one of my other action orders yeah. of how we slow ourselves down. Um, and, uh, but uh, what I'm encouraging them to do is, 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 is move in a direction and then uh, in some cases ask for forgiveness, don't ask for permission. Yes. Um, but make smart risk assessments as we do this. Because mm -hmm. as I like to say, there's a lot of good ideas that come out of the Pentagon until they hit your base. You go, that was a good idea that we built in a conference room, but then in execution, it doesn't work out so well. I trust our airmen to be able to take that and go, you know what? I know what the intent was. I've got a better way to do this. I have a way that we can do this and, and still be able to accomplish the mission and minimize the risk as we execute. Mm -hmm. And that's the level of trust I have in them. That's what I encourage them when I go out and talk to them. I go, I trust you. Um, just communicate what you're doing and then well, I'm gonna do my best to provide you the intent, the resources and the authorities to be able to execute what, what I've asked you to do and what the nation's asked you to do. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they appreciate that. I know I certainly would. I, uh... I want to talk a little more, take it up a level more enterprise-wide uh, beyond the individual airmen and talk a little bit about just, of course, the region of interest right now, which is the Indo-Pacific and, and your recent visit. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, um, I, Mackenzie would argue that the Hill is, um, everyone's coming from different perspectives, you from your Title mm -hmm. 10, uh, OSD from its its view and the hill from, from theirs. And I would argue there's a slightly diff different emphasis, if not larger than that, from each stakeholder here. And the hill is greatly concerned about the next five years and what happens on the ground, potentially, or in the air or at sea, in the Indo-Pacific. Um, 
And I think that's been a lot of the drive in the defense bills, not just the motivation behind the top line increases, but some of the specific changes we can talk about or not about for the Air Force. Um, so I, I want to, um, let's, let's think a little bit bigger. What are your, how would you characterize your three most important posture priorities in the Western Pacific, if you don't mind starting there? And then maybe we can talk about aircraft. Um, when I, I'll just kind of, as you were talking, I'm thinking through you know, my time as a, a uh, commander of Pacific Air Forces to where we are today. And what I've seen is a, uh, a bit of a shift collectively uh, on the focus on the Indo-Pacific. Uh, I felt as a pack out commander, you know, the further you got away from Washington, the less they fully appreciated the Indo-Pacific. Um, now that I'm in Washington, um, I don't necessarily see that. I, I do see that uh, uh, in, internal to the building, uh, the Pentagon, and, uh, over on, uh, on the Hill, uh, more and more focus on the Indo-Pacific. And uh, I think it's, and then I also would say, you know, my most recent visit in the Indo-Pacific, I spent time with my counterparts in Singapore and the Philippines. Uh, and the uh, Republic of Korea. Um, I also start to see more and more of a shift in, in a focus on um, the dynamics in the Indo-Pacific. Mm -hmm. And so from a, uh, from a broad perspective, you mentioned different, uh, different timelines, different priorities. That, yes, that's true. But I also see kind of a shift in, the, in, in, in that direction, even with the current events in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so that to me is a positive when you start talking about the aspect of accelerate, change, or lose, mm -hmm. and the focus on the Indo-Pacific, we're making shifts. Are we moving as quickly as we probably should or could? Uh, I think we probably could move a bit faster yeah. in, in areas uh, to be able to move forward. Um, but I do see that the, uh, the momentum is moving in that direction. Um, that's the feedback I've got from my, uh, uh, my partners in the region. Because I was also at a uh, Global Air and Space Chief Conference in the UK mm -hmm. uh, with 66 of my friends. Um, and uh, even European nations that are focused on the Indo-Pacific, you're starting to see. So um, there, there are some, some positive trend lines, but uh, you know, I want to make sure we're moving at a, you know, at a quick enough pace to ensure we continue to deter. So two examples. I, I suspect you may not bite on either one. So two examples of maybe wanting to move faster, but you know, still pushing the rock uphill. Uh, Long-range strike standoff weapons. And uh, you know, when, when you eventually get your next generation penetrating aircraft, 20, 30 time frame or so. But again, back to sort of the next five years. Is the Air Force ready to be a stand-in force immediately in indo -Pagon? No, we have some work to do. Um, uh, but I also th believe we've got to be able to have a, a hybrid force in both do stand-in and stand-off. And that's what we're focused on, uh, to be able to ride that capability. Um, you know, the aspect of being a stand-in force is we have allies and partners. Yeah. And uh, we can't build our strategy on a completely standoff force when we, we have our allies and partners that are actually standing in day to day, and we got to stay with them. And uh, the the other aspect of this is, you know, how do we actually look at our base resiliency? And that was one of the operational imperatives mm -hmm. that Secretary Kendall came in with. Uh, uh, how do we do our resilient basing, which includes, um, you know, how we do dispersion, how we do um, uh, uh, camouflage, concealment, deception, how we do hardening, um, how do we ensure that we have the uh, uh, we can continue to generate combat power, mm -hmm. uh, knowing that the threat is going to be a different threat than we've been facing for the past, uh, I would say, 30 years, mm -hmm. uh, in the Middle East in particular. And so we, we've got some work to do. Okay. Thank you for yeah. your candor. Can you give me any quick hot take from the chief's perspective on Ukraine and potential lessons learned in Beijing about, or even from your own, just me, the chief, this is what I'm taking away from Well, I, you know, I, I do, um, there's several things that I, um, I take away, and I think we're all learning something. Yeah. Uh, the power of information mm -hmm. and how information played into uh, some of the decision making that occurred leading up to and during uh, the, the past six months. Mm -hmm. uh, the aspect of how we're able to uh, share information with allies and partners, how it brought the international community together for the sanctions, how it brought NATO together, um, and th those that work with NATO. Uh, NATO moved at a pretty lightning uh, uh, pace compared to what they normally do. Um, but it was at the aspect of information. I also think about the aspect of air power. Mm -hmm. And you see that um, um, the value of where air power could play in, uh, um, in, in various areas. And the aspect of uh, what the Ukrainians were able to do with their air defenses was mm -hmm. to deny uh, the Russians the ability to use their air power. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, uh, that's something we had to think about um, collectively. 
Mm -hmm. um, but it's also um, the doctrine of how the Soviets of uh, uh, the Russians, excuse me, have, have operated, yeah. where they their air power only goes where they have ground superiority, right. by and large, and. Uh, we operate differently from a doctrine standpoint. Um, but it's really, the, you know, how do you bring uh, information, but also the interoperability with our allies and partners. And that's something I, we, I think we've, we've also seen with NATO, our ability to respond as air forces and how uh, uh, General uh, Hecker today, but his predecessor, General Regan, who was the USAFE Af Africa commander, but also the AIRCOM for NATO, mm -hmm. the work that they were able to do uh, ahead of time to uh, be able to you know, move aircraft around very quickly to show a level of support, mm -hmm. but also a level of interoperability yeah. uh, that they were been working on for you know a number of years. But it also all that comes to fruition when you've actually uh, done all the uh, the pre work right. um, to make sure we've got the you know, connectivity, the tactics, techniques, and procedures, the relationships. Yeah. Uh, all, all those are important. Uh, it, it's, it just popped into my head, so. Forgive me for the, the quick sidebar here. So the, uh, over the, when the House Speaker traveled to Taiwan, uh, Beijing demonstrated you know, basically an air and naval primarily, but I would argue a joint force mostly, um, air and naval blockade, which could also slash be quarantine. Basically, for an island that imports almost entirely its food and electricity could be incredibly damaging. The US military could quickly get involved, but not an invasion, or it could that could lay the groundwork for one, sure. But my layman's non, no, no clearance understanding is in the building, the focus is on the invasion. What we saw mocked up and dress rehearsed was blockade and quarantine. Are you thinking that we need to think bigger about the, the possibilities? Yeah. Well, actually, as I was engaging uh, here recently, you know, it was said that uh, the PRC just played their cards. Which card, we're not sure. <laughs> Um, but it did, you know, we're going to learn something by based on what they just did. Yeah. And uh, I think we collectively um, got to take, we, we're always going to take a broader look. Because um, yeah, I think in, in any case, we always, you know, anytime we try to predict the future, we don't necessarily get it right. Um, but we can help shape the future. Mm -hmm. and I've always believed that. And uh, you know, using that information to be able to take a look at the, you know, the assumptions we already have, because I also believe facts and assumptions always change. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the aspect of continuous analysis um, internal to the department uh, will be important to uh, use what we just saw, but also what we've been seeing over the course of the past uh, uh, several years and what we see in the future to, to help shape you know, mm -hmm. how we might do things and, and prepare ourselves. Okay, good, but fair. Uh, before I, I, I move to audience questions, we actually have a, a couple more minutes, so I, I'm grateful for that. Just briefly want to talk on acquisition. I, I don't, uh, but it's kind of linked a little bit, not just of hardware, but of software. Okay. So I, I would argue, uh, you know, the Air Force, when they lost their chief software officer uh, last year, it was, it was in a quite, spec in DC norms and ways, it was pretty spectacular. So one news outlet described it as the US Air Force chief software quits after launching Hellfire missile of a LinkedIn post. Uh, and then another as, Saying he said the U.S. has already lost the AI fight to China. So I want to get into acquisition more broadly, but I want to specifically talk about software. And I know, are you looking for a replacement? Did this make it to your level? Or did you follow the fallout uh, from this? I've uh, watched part of the fallout. Um, and I realized that uh, our previous chief software officer was frustrated based on uh, various aspects. Mm -hmm. And I know Secretary Kinn was uh, looking at, uh, you know, how we approach uh, the future chief software officers mm -hmm. uh, at that particular position, uh, because it ends up on the secretary side is where yes. that, that hiring process goes. Got it. That's, his, um, that's for him. Uh, but by the same token, though, um, I am also paying attention to software yeah. and, and the aspect of how we use software and, and the development of future capability, mm -hmm. um, how we make sure we have a workforce that is able to uh, work in a cyber environment to do software. Um, how we retain that workforce, and then the other part of how do we collaborate with industry in certain areas. We have you know, very patriotic uh, uh, Americans and allies and partners that want to work with us. How do we might not make it so hard? You know, and what I mean by that is you know, Department of Defense is a big, uh, big organization, and then you're a small company. You know, what door do you knock on before you get tired of knocking on doors? Yes. 
Um, and we've got to make it easier to work with and uh, be able to uh, develop software and move forward. And then I think there's also the policies. Um, I like to say some of our policies are kind of from the dial-up modem era. <laughs> Um, that we actually got to move forward. Floppy disks? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah floppy disks and dial-up uh, uh, modem. And we got to be able to have policies, realize there are some risks associated with it, but uh, there's also risks about moving forward. Right. And uh, being able to do software uh, a bit more dynamically like uh, we see outside the Department of Defense. You brought up agile combat employment, and it's linked to some acquisition priorities that you also have. So I'm wondering if you've made, or your team, has made, um, you know, how have you improved the adoption of commercial technology? So that way, you know, there's more capacity and, you know, mass adoption of AC. Uh, uh, well, Agile Common Point is, uh, uh, is really taking root. And it's one of the things, the exciting things I get a chance when I go out and visit bases and talk to our room and, and the energy and the, the, they've, they put into it to look at not only from a software standpoint, but being light, lean, and agile. Mm -hmm. um, in the future, we're not going to be able to go to like the bases we've been going to in the Middle East. Many of the bases we operate in the Middle East are the same bases we went to and when Desert Shield kicked off. Yep. And what I've told them is you're not going to go someplace where the Wi-Fi is already set up, the gym's already there, the, the dining facility is there. You know, where am I going to, where do I put my bags? You, you're going to have to build from scratch, mm -hmm. get it going, and maybe tear it down mm -hmm. to move to the next location. And so it's a, it's a mindset that goes with. Um, and you're going to need to be able to have things that are very user, uh, what I'd say user friendly. Uh, you just think about your smartphone. It doesn't come with a set of instructions. It's got to be intuitive. And that's the aspect of software and how we want to be able to bring software and other tools that we see uh, in our day-to-day -day lives mm -hmm. into the Department of Defense to make it, uh, in the Department of the Air Force, and the Air Force in particular, uh, to make it a little easier for them. And, uh, they, have the they have the skill set to do this. Mm -hmm. We just got to make it uh, a little easier for them to be able to, to bring in that kind of capability and technology and be able to work with, uh, you know, whether it's the big companies and the small companies, mm -hmm. to bring that capability. So you you basically said, and I agree. You know, or, or let me ask you: Do you agree that you need a more dispersed posture in the Western Pacific airfields, um, fuel and munitions? So what we've seen, or at least other service chiefs have talked publicly, and maybe you have an apology if I missed it, but um, you know, um, some of that was. So, for example, for the Army, they're pre-post docs, right? Expanded, mm -hmm. tested, pulled out everything, put it back in, threw out the old spare parts, ran cycles through it, and then they were able to fall in, you know, in <clears throat> two weeks' time on it and when, when the flare went up, so to speak. Are, are you seeing similar, a similar need for the Air Force in the Indo-PACOM region? Uh, I do. That, that's the whole aspect of agile combat employment, um, the, the ability to, you know, in, in past uh, environments, we would disperse on an airfield. So we take the aircraft and spread them apart. Mm -hmm. uh, what I look at is how do you disperse across airfields? Okay. And the more airfields you can operate from, the more options that uh, we have. But at the same time, it creates more uh, places that our adversaries have to pay attention to. The other aspect, as you highlighted, is, is how we pre-position capability. Um, and uh, not only do it in the head of a conflict, but how do we do it on a day-to-day -day basis mm -hmm. so we actually do exactly like you described, to be able to have equipment there, uh, capability, that we're able to use for exercises, yeah. so our adversary sees it, our allies and partners see it, um, and we uh, we're not shipping, you know, uh, unit owned equipment back and forth. Right. They fall in on, on capability, and uh, and so that's a process we're working through as well. Okay, terrific. Uh, last question. Now, you you mentioned earlier about that terrific. Um, I forgot the term. The the pilot program, literally mm -hmm. pilot, or oh, flight academy. Yes, thank you, flight academy. I hope that will help, in the pipeline, longer term, reduce the stress on the Air Force for its pilot shortages, particularly fighter pilots, yes? I don't know if you wanted to update us on any of the latest there, but I just wanted to ask a specific question about, you know, for every pilot, you also have a bunch of maintainers behind them, right, keeping mm -hmm. that airplane in the air. As you know, I know this is something that you're thinking about. And the, the F-35, A-10 dynamic, I know Congress was a little more generous on the A-10 in your view, probably, um, this year in the defense bills that are moving now. But last year's, their preservation of the A-10s caused some hiccups in moving maintainers around for the F-35. So are you, am I right that the flight academy could help with the pilot shortage? Is it getting better in general? And then, um, and then how are you thinking about your maintainer, um, Jenga, right. <laughs> in America? Yeah, on the, on the pilot uh, 
aspect, uh, we, are, uh, we have several initiatives uh, in place to increase our, uh, our production. Um, whether it's uh, using the flight academy to attract, but at the same time, how do we do it in an accelerated path to wings for those that already have experience? Uh, how do we use uh, some of the uh, uh, technology so um, it is more focused on the individual? Mm -hmm. If they have the aptitude, they can move faster through uh, the course mm -hmm. um, in, in some aspects. Um, but I still think we're, we're gonna be, uh, even with the, those initiatives, we'll be challenged because the airlines are hiring. And that's one of the things we're, it's a national asset. Yes. Um, whether it's uh, for the commercial sector or for, for uh, the military. And so that's something we'll, we'll continue to work on. We'll also continue to engage with our, uh, our commercial friends because a lot of times we help produce what ends up in, the, in their cockpit. So, so you gonna, actually talk to them about we do. We, not we're, stealing your people so fast? Well, we're in this together. <laughs> okay. um, so, um, so we do uh, uh, pay attention to, uh, to that aspect. On the, uh, not only on the, uh, you, you, you described the maintenance jenga, and the thing that we, I, we do think about is we don't have, as we bring on additional new capability, we don't have airmen sitting and waiting on the bench to actually go execute. The same airmen that are executing and operating, right. operating and maintaining the platforms we have today are the same airmen we're gonna retrain right. to go do the next one. And so whether it's KC-135 to KC-46, A-10 to F-35, mm -hmm. um, that's what we're, we have a plan to how do we transition that, because we're not gonna get, just, like I said, additional airmen that are gonna just be sitting there waiting for us to. Right to make the change. So it, it is a bit of a jingle puzzle. And every time we're not able to do something, um, it, 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 it has a ripple effect. Mm -hmm. One of the key areas I, I, I think I have a responsibility for, and I've been really focused on, is engaging with members uh, and staffers on the Hill to explain that particular process mm -hmm. and uh, having a good plan. And uh, we, I think that's actually helped us. It's helped us in a transition to the KC-46. It's helped us, as you described uh, in this, uh, uh, NDA that's in, uh, on the Hill to actually start the, the process with the A-10. Mm -hmm. And so um, part of that is a dialogue. And uh, it, it can't be a dialogue when the budget goes over. It has to happen well before the budget goes over. Right. And that's been one of my goals. Right. Yes, and I think you made some success this year, so well done. I, I know you, that's a multi-year effort on it your is. part. <laughs> Uh, okay, our first question is from Bloomberg. We can guess which friends over there. But uh, they're asking about um, your current sustainment concerns with the F-35A, if you have any. Uh, are you seeing satisfactory reductions in the projected cost per flying hour over 21 estimates? I guess the last estimate we have was about 36000 per hour. Uh, I'll stop there because I keep talking. No, we... Um, it would We've been working very closely with uh, um, in engaging internal to the Air Force, but also with the uh, Joint Program Office, but also with Lockheed Martin, mm -hmm. and, uh, and in particular uh, Pratt & Whitney as well with the, uh, the current engine uh, on sustainment. And so it's been a topic, and I engage with the uh, uh, leadership from each one of those organizations on a regular basis, um, because it is a, it's something we are uh, concerned about. We wanna make sure we bring that cost down. One area, instead of, uh, we've, we've kind of kind of shifted a bit to look at cost per tail per year, mm -hmm. more so than flying hour. And uh, so you have a better understanding. And I would say earlier on, some of our uh, uh, estimates were a little bit optimistic mm -hmm. uh, as an Air Force. Um, and we're kind of reassessing that. And uh, that's something that uh, myself and Secretary Kendall have been talking to members on. And we expect to, you know, we'll probably get uh, uh, you know, a requirement to come back and report uh, an updated cost per tail per year. Uh, but we do, as we get more and more aircraft and learn more and more about the airplane, uh, we are starting to see some of that cost come down. But it's mm -hmm. probably, uh, like I said, the original cost per tailboard year is probably a bit optimistic. Okay. Um, uh, Mackenzie gets really nervous when the services start changing the metrics. Right. Yeah. <laughs> now, I'm not saying it's anything nefarious, but, you know, every QDR slash NDS, you know, it's, we, we're squadrons now, you know, or it's yeah. divisions now, it's BCTs, it's squadrons now, with the squadron size is smaller. I get nervous on the outside. Yeah. It gets harder and harder to track. So just quickly, cost per tail per year instead of cost per flying hour, why, why the change? Well, that drives, because uh, it gives you a bit, a bit better perspective of what you, you know, your total cost of ownership. Mm -hmm. And we had cost per tail per year earlier in the process of what we did, probably didn't talk about it much. <laughs> okay. So. Okay, fair enough. Uh, great question from Radio Free Asia. And then we're going to come here in-house in to um, Corey right after this. Great. Um, Secretary of State, Blinken is prepared to make both short and longer term adjustments to U.S. military posture to respond to provocations from North Korea in June. 
Uh, do you have any, do you know of, are you working on, are you thinking about any plans uh, to adjust Air Force posture and uh, similarly? No, no, uh, no conversations, but I, I, here's what I will tell you is uh, when I was in the, in the Republic of Korea here recently, I had a chance to meet with the, uh, uh, General Camera, mm -hmm. uh, USFK commander, and my, uh, my counterpart, uh, General Jung, the uh, Rock Aff Air Chief. And uh, the discussion there was uh, our exercise program and uh, you know, increasing our exercise program. Mm -hmm. uh, we just had F-35s for the first, US F-35s on the peninsula here just recently. Excellent. And that was been something that we've been talking about <laughs> since I was a PACAF commander to get fifth gen on Glad the peninsula. Yeah. Um, and, and so uh, what I do see is uh, increasing cooperation uh, like I've seen throughout my Air Force career. My first assignment was to Kunsan Air Base Korea mm -hmm. as a brand new F-16 pilot. And watching where we are today, we've made a lot of progress. And uh, I don't know that uh, you know we haven't got any guys to start any planning. But uh, I, what I will tell you, we've got a really good relationship with the uh, with the Rock Great, Corey, please. Corey Shockey from AEI. I'd be interested in your thinking about the mission sets for manned and unmanned platforms, and how you see that potentially changing on a ten or a fifteen year time frame. We are definitely head, heading down the path of uh, you know, crewed and uncrewed aircraft. Uh, in fact, I was just in a meeting this morning to talk about the aspect of autonomy and how that plays into our collaborative combat aircraft and where we're, where we're headed. If you recall, uh, two of our operational imperatives uh, laid out by Secretary Kendall talk about a family of systems, next generation air dominance, and, and part of it is where a lot of our focus is, and to be able to these, bring on these combat collaborative aircraft that can actually um, you know, be a sensor, be a shooter, be a weapons carrier, um, and reduce the cost of operations is a path we're, we're definitely on. So related follow-up to Corey's question, very timely, uh, also came in online. So it was similar to hers, but then there was a follow-up uh, wondering if you expect this aircraft to be ready and operational by the time the NGAD aircraft achieves operational capability. Um, that's a good question. Um, what we're looking at is not necessarily to do it solely with NGAD. Okay. Um, how do you do it with uh, F-35, for example? Um, how, do, how do you use it with other platforms? Could, could you operate it from a ground station? Could you operate it from a, a seat on a, on a E-7 wedge tail or on a KC-46? Mm -hmm. And so we want to not constrain ourselves just to say it's only going to be um, tied to next generation uh, uh, air dominance platform. But okay. you know, how do we look at it uh, from a broader perspective as well? I'm glad you brought up the wedge tail, sir, because I had one of my questions. I just dig that back out here. Okay, so we know the AWACS replacement is important to you, to everyone. Um, uh, earlier this year, the Air Force wanted, decided to pursue a sole source for the, the E-7, um, the most likely replacement. So both chambers of Congress want you to move as fast as possible. Uh, I think there's um, concern on the Hill. There's no reprogramming. There's no program office standing up. So... Are you being risk averse or are you moving as fast as possible? No, we're moving fast. Okay. Um, we, we've, we've been engaging on the Hill on this okay. particular topic. We've engaged uh, um, with members, um, particularly from Oklahoma uh, <laughs> and Alaska, um, because uh, they have an interest. Um, but we are, um, and we're working very closely with them as well, and, and in terms of the uh, uh, Department of Defense, to look at opportunities to be able to accelerate and do some reprogramming okay. um, uh, to be able to move forward. Great. I'm looking around here for my... The people who schlepped all the way into the AEI headquarters who will get the priority. Go over here. Hi, General Bound. Thank you so much for speaking with us. I'm really thrilled about your integrated design approach, and I wondered what are the sm some of the most important lessons that you've learned from our allies and partners in the past few years? Right. Let us know who you are, please. Catherine Tyson, uh, Critical Threats Project at Great. AEI. Thank you. Yeah, integrated by design. Um, I, I talked about this at the uh, when I was in the UK for their Global Air and Space Chiefs Conference, and it's not. I don't see that it's anything new. It's just something where I've crystallized some of my thinking and really put more emphasis on. And what I found is that our, our allies and partners really want to work with us, but in some cases we make it hard. And uh, and what I, there's three areas I look at. There's people, policy, and processes. We're doing pretty good on the people part. Um, the relationships that we have, how we do some of our, uh, our training, uh, how we do our uh, exchange programs, uh, that part works. But it's the policy and process that sometimes slows us down. And what I find sometimes is, uh, you know, our, our allies and partners want various capabilities, and we'll 
for whatever reason, uh, from a policy standpoint, say that the, we're going to staff it'll take a while. Um, but I also found that uh, as uh, things happen in Europe, there were some things we were debating happened fairly quickly. And so my point there is mm -hmm. we got we to be able to actually do that on a regular basis and not wait till there's a crisis. And if we're going to say no, not right now, what are the criteria that would actually leading up to an event break open that policy to allow our allies and partners to have a capability or do something that we haven't allowed them to do in the past or for whatever reason. Um, and so I, I've learned that our partner, allies and partners are patient. Um, uh, but I've also, the one takeaway I do have is that uh, I learn more by listening than talking. And uh, I've served all my time as a general officer, not in Washington, D.C., until I became the chief. And by doing that, I spent a lot of time with our allies and partners. And that, that was the one key area I found. And even on this most recent trip, talking to, uh, uh, in Singapore in particular, uh, talking to some of the leadership there, there's some things they share with me that I go, you know what, I didn't think about that. And, and that, to me, is one of the key things I've learned as a senior leader that I can bring back into the building to go, they have a perspective and we need to listen. Um, and, uh, and, and how do we help them, help all of us collectively to ensure for our global security? Thanks for the question. Are you clamoring to get back out of D.C.? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to answer that. All right. So um, actually, a couple of questions came in from different um, press sources, but I'll, I'll read Politico's, but there was an echo from other groups. Um, give us your reaction, please, to China repeatedly crossing the median line into the Taiwan Strait. And then a follow-up is, are you considering sending fighter aircraft to Ukraine? Is that still on the table? Um, let me, on the Ukraine piece, I'm like, I'll, I'll just not address, you know, what we're doing is uh, we're, we're, we're going to support whatever the president decides. Mm -hmm. So, uh, on, um, you know, what's happening in the Indo-Pacific, and, uh, and I go back to the aspect of uh, when I was really focused on the Middle East and, you know, the features got built in the South China Sea back in the 2014 time frame. Um, there's a slow, insidious uh, aspect of, you know, pushing uh, the, the edge. That's something we got to pay attention to. And if we don't respond or react to it, then, you know, they've taken another step, taken another step, taken another step. Um, and this is where we, not only as the United States, but also I think with our allies and partners, and that's why I think we start to see a little bit more of the coalescing uh, with our allies and partners in the, particularly in the Pacific. I, I'd also say, as I said, uh, countries in Europe as well, um, start to see and start to re react and respond and speak up. And, uh, that's something I think we all got to, got to be able to do. Okay. I agree. We'll go over here next. Hello. Uh, thank you for coming, to, uh, General Brown. My name is Wes Culp. I'm from the Center for the Study of the Presidency and Congress. And my question was about um, whether you were able to speak to reports that the Air Force is thinking about scrapping uh, units charged with train, advise, and assist. Um, and whether that is going to go through or what the status of that is. Now, um, so I had a meeting on that just this, uh, a week or so ago before I went on leave. Um, and we really talk, had a conversation about what does our air advisor program need to look like going forward? Thinking about the, the way um, some of this developed, particularly with our work in the Middle East uh, with the Iraqi Air Force and, uh, and the Afghan Air Force, what does it look like in the future? And uh, I think the questions to that, I gave them a bit of a task to come back to me um, because those were focused on flying in certain aspects. I don't know if that's got to be the case in the future. Uh, there may be some aspects of that depending on what countries are working with. Uh, but I also believe um, the, the aspect of how, how many uh, units do you need to really have? Um, how much, uh, how many individuals or women do we have to have the, need to have the expertise? And can they bring along experts, you know, a maintainer or a cyber operator that's not an air advisor that can come along and build a team to go out and engage. And so there's probably a, a, what I would say a mix of units or individuals. And that was what I tasked them to come back and take a look at of, you know, how many units do we really need to have? Because what, what I don't want to do is build a bunch of units and then they're sitting around with, with not a lot of places to go. Um, so there's a bit of balance, a little bit of analysis we got to do. And I, I'm really, the engineering background, I like the analysis. Uh, to be doing do analysis versus doing it based on feeling and emotion. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, we have two more in the room, but I, I just want to ask a follow-up to that. 
great power competition. If we lose the competition, it could become the, the conflict. I uh, hope we don't, of course. Mm. In your mind, uh, what is the decisive weapon or capability if it, in, the, in the deterrence, conventional or nuclear, and then in a conflict if needed, that you want the joint force to have? Um, there's, there's maybe, I, I would hit two things. One is uh, our, our ability to um, see and make decisions. Mm -hmm. This is why, you know, when you look at uh, Joint All Demand Command and Control, it's ability not only to command and control the operational piece, but it's also to provide the information for decision makers mm -hmm. so you can stay ahead of and continue to deter. So, so that's one, uh, one piece. The other is the relationships with our allies and partners. Um, and, uh, and have a good understanding of where they, where they, uh, where they stand in certain areas, and how we can continue to work together. To whether it's uh, interoperability, whether it's integrated by design, or it's access, spacing, and overflight, mm -hmm. uh, having a good understanding there. And those are the, I think, the key areas that will help us, not only as a joint force, but also with our allies and partners, to make sure we're able to deter and assure, mm -hmm. and if need be, if called upon to do so, respond to a crisis. Sure. Okay. Do it. Probably our last two. Sir, good morning. George good morning. Nicholson, the Washington rep for the Global Special Operations Forces Foundation. You talk about technology. I'm really impressed with what General Berger is doing right now. The difficult, you know, the firestorm that's going on in the, Mar right. the Marines. I think Secretary Kendall is going down the same path. For an example, he said, why do we need 105 rescue helicopters? What are they doing? What's, what's the requirement? I was one of the leads on the, uh, the study that was done for you. Uh, Worldwide missionary analysis for personnel recovery. We went all out. Basically, realistically, we have not done an Air Force combat rescue since 1972. And what has driven the requirements for rescue right now, you remember when Secretary Gates went to Afghanistan and he looked over in the Army and was saying, We can't do medevac within one hour. And he said, What are those 10 helicopters doing over there? Those are Air Force CSAR. Why can't they do the mission? So I see that in the language in the Defense Authorization Act, there's a requirement to go for the Air Force to really go back and say, what is the real requirement for CSAR? And what disappoints me is, I think when I was with General Ruger last week, uh, the head of uh, Army Vertical Lift, and he talks about the two new variants out there, the Valor aircraft, 280 knots, the Defiant, 280 knots, flies faster than the V-22, can operate off any Navy, ship in the Navy inventory, uh, can refuel off strategic tankers. The Air Force seems to have very little interest whatsoever going pursuing that path. Your comments? Well, you know, one of the areas that we, you know, we're going down the path right now, the H.H. Siski uh, whiskey. Um, but uh, I, um, your comments are well taken, partly because I've asked the same question of how, you know, how are we going to do, we've been doing combat search and rescue the same way we've been doing since Vietnam. Okay. And in a future environment, I'm not sure that's the same way we're going to be able to do it. And this is why, if you've looked at it, we're, we're cutting our, our HH-60 uh, whiskey buy, which causes, you know, you, can, you, know you, you know how that happens here in D.C. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we've got to really start to make a shift. And this is the question I've asked our, our staff. Of, you know, what do we need to do, be thinking about in the future about how we do combat search and rescue? And we need to challenge ourselves. Because, as I said, the facts and assumptions change, and the, the fact of the threat is much different today than it is or was, you know, back in, uh, in Vietnam, and, the, and we have the same approach. And uh, I'm afraid we're going to lose a bunch of people on a helicopter or, you know, or a CV or MV-22. So we really got to think differently about how we do. And part of the discussion is uh, how do you use autonomous vehicles that might go out and pick uh, an isolated personnel up um, in, uh, in a high-threat environment? And if you lose the vehicle, Maybe it's not that big a deal. Uh, we still want to bring that, you know, uh, bring that member back and get them back uh, back home with, you know, to their family. And that's the goal. Thanks for the question. Before we get to the very last one, um, sir, quick follow up. Uh, does PB twenty three ends production of the HH sixty whiskey? Yes, and is that a line shutdown? Um, I have to get back to you on the. Don't worry what, about it. uh, it's a nerd but, question. Yeah, but, but uh, I mean, part, part of this is we, we do have to take a hard look at what, uh, going back to the question, your question as well. You know, what does combat search and rescue look like in the future? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this is a conversation of when I sit down with our major, my major command commanders, we've had a, a bit of a deep dive. We haven't come back with a response yet, mm -hmm. but we've, we've teed up the question of we, how do we do this in the future? And there are those, this is the challenge I have internal to the Air Force when you're trying to drive change. 
It's those that are like the platform they grew up in, sure. they're in love with it, they never want to see it go. Uh, or it's you know, in someone's state or district, they never want to see it go. We got a threat that's driving us going down a different path. Mm -hmm. And we've got to make a shift. And, and that to me is one of the, the challenges we get in, you know, I will have plenty of work for these airmen to do, yeah. just not in that airplane, right. okay? Yep. We, we want to shift to get them something newer that's going to give them the capability to actually go generate air power anytime, anywhere. Mm -hmm. Quickly, please, last question. How are you doing? Thanks for coming today. Uh, Jacob Atkinson uh, with United Western Group, a private equity firm here in Washington. Um, one of the areas we focus on is lower middle market uh, aerospace manufacturing companies. My question to you is, what are your thoughts on the strength of the industrial base, specifically uh, the hundreds of companies that service the tier one OEMs? You were talking, you meet with you know, Lockheed um, executives and some of the other guys. Are they talking at all about um, the fragmentation and uh, issues that some of these lower level suppliers are having, specifically with supply chain issues, labor shortages across the countries? Uh, really as a threat to national security as some of these smaller manufacturers that don't have the same resources to deal with some of the economic challenges of uh, today? We, we have talked about it, but not in a lot of detail. Um, and, um, but I, I know it's a concern not only for us as, a, as an Air Force, but also with our, our, our large uh, OEMs as they look around, because it does have a, lo a longer term impact as they're trying to get things done and deliver on time. And uh, this is a dialogue we've got to continue to have about how do we actually ensure um, we continue to be effective where we've gotten very efficient. And this is a conversation we've had internal to the Air Force as well as, as we do our depots. We've got very, very efficient, but that may not be effective if you start to have to surge. And, and that to me is one of the areas that we've got to really think about of you know, understanding it. I really do believe that uh, COVID actually helped us in some regards to better sense that, hey, there's some, there's some challenges here when we start looking at our supply chain. And even today, as we continue to have that conversation about our supply chain, where we gotta build some resiliency into our supply chains um, um, across the department uh, of the Air Force, but also with our industry partners. And uh, so it is a uh, ongoing dialogue. Don't know that we solved it, but uh, it's, you know, the first way you solve our problem is you gotta admit there is a problem. And uh, knowing that we've got some challenges there uh, is gonna help us all uh, start to move forward and, and address this particular issue. Thanks for the question. Sir, if, if in some distant future you're still chief and near distant future and Congress says, you know, we want to do a military infrastructure, we, we'll find the money, don't you worry about it. Uh, you know, bigger than the Shipyard Act for depots and arsenals and hangars. Would the Air Force welcome that kind of? I, I think we would. I think we would, you know, to help us out in our depot piece, but also from an infrastructure piece, we'd also take a look at the, uh, the aspect that we've got, uh, we're oversubscribed in some areas of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. by about 20%. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, closing some of that infrastructure right. to put that money back in other areas uh, would be something that the, uh, you know, I know the Air Force would appreciate. It's not the wrong way, not the 2005 way. No, not, not necessarily. The, the base yeah, we, we talked about that one. Yeah, good. All right. <laughs> um, Please join me in thanking General Brown for this morning. <laughs>